This is One Man's Family. One Man's Family is dedicated to the mothers and fathers of the younger generation and to their bewildering offspring. Today transcribed, we present Chapter 1, Book 73, entitled, What Does the Future Hold? It is mid-afternoon on the first day of the second half of the 20th century, January the 1st, 1950. In their various homes at Seacliff in San Francisco, the members of the barber clan are preparing to go to the family home to celebrate New Year's Day. Nicky won't be there, of course. He is in England on business. But there will be a goodly representation of barbers. Father Barber insists that his children rally round on the holiday. And although New Year's Day is a sort of letdown day for most people... For Henry and Fanny Barber, it is a day of reaffirmation and renewal of family ties and affection. As they sit in the library, they seem quite content with the world. Well, there might be just an occasional little fuss from Henry. I think we should take the tree down tomorrow, Henry. It's beginning to shed. (laughs) Mm. You know, there's something sad about a Christmas tree on New Year's. It's like an old horse that's outlived its usefulness. Nobody wants it. Nobody wants what? A horse, Henry. I said it was like an old horse. What is? You haven't been listening to a word I've said. Why don't you put down that old paper? What are you finding so fascinating, anyway? Uh, Just looking at some of these New Year's Eve pictures here. Look at all these people milling around. And and this couple making a spectacle of themselves. Why, they must be as old as we are. Tooting on a silly little toy horn. (laughs) Ridiculous. Looks to me like they're having a good time, Henry. Good time, indeed. How can anybody have a good time in the midst of all that noise and confusion? I can remember when you used to like to celebrate, too, when we were younger. You didn't think it was so foolish then. We tempered our celebration with a little judgment in those days. Now it's crash, bang, go here, go there. Never a thought to the solemnity of the occasion. Just create a monumental bedlam. That seems to be the modern idea of welcoming in a new year. In our day, Fanny, we conducted ourselves like ladies and gentlemen. Oh, fiddlesticks. Yes. Well, don't tell me that you would have liked to have been out somewhere last night instead of spending the evening here quietly with me. Of course not, my dear. I loved our New Year's Eve. <laughs> not very exciting for you, I'm afraid. Just the two of us sitting here, talking. <laughs> in bed and sound asleep long before midnight. Weren't even awake when 1950 rolled around. But we had such a nice sleep. <laughs> We've seen a good many New Year's together, my dear. Yes, Henry. Half of a century. How far off 1950 seemed when we were married. Mm-hmm. We were thinking about 1900 then. The years are so long when you're young. <laughs> oh, but they've been good years, Henry. We've had a wonderful life together with wonderful children. And just think how fortunate we are to have them all right here. Why, most people who have grown children have them scattered all over the country. Hardly ever see one another. <laughs> Paul might as well be in another part of the country for all we ever see of him. Oh, let's not get started on Paul. As far as that goes, he's up in his studio right this minute. He's been very good about being home around the holidays. Is he going to be here this evening for supper with the others? Of course. You heard him say he was. I can't be sure of anything concerning him since he fell into the snare of the... Henry. Huh? This is 1950. Is that supposed to be news? Well, you were fussing. Remember your resolution. No fussing in 1950. Well, I... I... <coughs> yes, yes. Uh, going to be pretty hard resolution for you to keep, I'm afraid. Hi. Huh? Why, that's Jack. Jack! Yeah, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. We're in the library. I'm coming. All alone, isn't it? Hiya, Mom. Oh, I just ducked through the hedge without a coat, and it's kind of cold now. Hi, Dan. Yeah, yeah. S- sit down, boy. Sit down. Uh, get here close to the fire, Jack. Your hands are icy. Oh, this is okay. Uh, where are the rest of the family? Oh, they'll be long later. I had to get out. I couldn't take it anymore. Eh, take what? Oh, Mary Lou pulled Sharon Ann's hair, and then she hit Mary Lou, and then, and then they started crying, and that set the triplets off, and pretty soon all six were going at once. Oh, poor darling. <laughs> Quite a caterwauling, as I imagine. <laughs> Brother. I wonder if I shouldn't go over and help out. Oh, sit still, Mom. Betty Nicolette will handle it. I just thought it'd be better if I got out from underfoot. I didn't seem to be doing any good. I think Betty was kind of glad to see me go. Said I'd been short-tempered all day. Out late last night, I suppose. Oh, sure. Betty wanted to go out, so we went. 
Last time I'll ever try to dance on a New Year's Eve, unless I got a catcher's outfit on, complete with mask and shin guards. <laughs> oh, Jack. Yeah. What a hassle. Exactly what I've been telling your mother. Seems to bring out idiocy in the people. Hmm? I understand Cliff and Paul had a double date. Where'd they go? Where did they go, Henry? Did Paul say this morning? <laughs> Nobody ever tells me anything. Least of all, Paul. Well, must not have been too rugged for him. Sharon Ann reported that Paul was up and over at the Fromes this morning fairly early. Hmm? <laughs> sure. She keeps us up on the doings over there. She wants to be flower girl when he gets married. Now, who said he was going to get married? Nobody, Henry. You know how children run on. Yeah. Does seem to be getting serious, though. Be which moments early. He'll get over it. Maybe. But it seems to me that... Paul... I wonder if Clifford's up in the studio with Paul. Be nice if they came down here and joined us. Cliff and Paul are getting to be quite the buddies, aren't they? Why, Jack, they've always been close. Yeah, but not the way they've been lately. Going out on double dates and all that stuff. Paul's always been a kind of a lone wolf when it came to taking women out. Yeah, be buying a ukulele next thing you know. Henry. <laughs> hey, Dad. Happy New Year! Well, that's Claude. Hi! Where is everybody? In here, Claudia. All right, taking off my coat. Hmm? Taking off her coat, Henry. Oh. Well, this is a cozy little group. Yeah. Happy New Year. <laughs> my Claudia, my Dad. Dad. Where's all the rest of the family? Oh, everybody will be along later. Hey, any news from Nicholas? I talked to him on the telephone last night. He called just at midnight. Oh, it was so exciting. Any idea when he'll be home? Oh, nothing definite. I'm afraid things aren't working out too well over there. What do you mean, Claudia? Oh, it seems that they might have to sell some of the property or something now. I don't know. He said not to worry, but I think he's running into a lot more trouble than he expected. Gosh, I thought he'd be coming home right after New Year's. Yeah, so did I. Now I don't know when he'll be able to get back. Oh, it's just awful. Now, my dear, it'll all work out. You wait and see. Nicky isn't going to stay away one minute longer than he has to. Oh, I know that, Mom. It's just that being separated this way is so terrible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where are Joan and Penelope? Oh, they've been invited out to a party. I thought you wouldn't mind if they didn't come over. Of course not. We're just going to have a little pick-up supper. We'll eat early so everybody can get home. Oh, that's for me. I'm going to be in the sack tonight before it's dark. Hmm? Be in the what? The sack, Dad. You know, hit the cheese. Yeah, I presume that means go to bed. <laughs> you guessed it, Dad. It seems to me, Jack, that it's hardly fitting for an attorney at law to use slang the way you do. It's a habit that's growing on you, too. Okay, Dad, I only do it around home when I'm relaxed. Down at the office, I'm as stuffy as they come. Oh, don't get stuffy, Jack. I prefer the way you are. It keeps you young. <laughs> you know, it's hard for me to think of Jack being grown up and a father <laughs> and... I know exactly what you mean. Jack will always be the baby. Well, I've got plenty of evidence over at my house that I am a father. When I left a little while ago, there were six witnesses testifying at the top of their lungs to the fact. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I feel so much better when I get around the family. I lose that desolate feeling of Nikki being away. Everything seems so cozy and secure. Yeah, it is good to have your family about you. That's one of the joys of the holidays. It is real nice family. It renews their bonds, reaffirms affection and love. You should come over oftener, Claudia. You mustn't sit at home and brood or be lonely. Oh, I was just feeling a little sorry for myself today. I'm all right now, Mom, really. Say, uh, did you say Paul and Cliff are up in the studio, Mom? Well, I imagine that's where they are. They're both home. Well, what do you suppose they're finding to talk about all this time anyway? Hey, you're not going to sleep there, are you, Cliff? No, no, I heard what you said. I was just thinking about something, Paul, and I've got an idea. Oh, well, let's hear it. Look, most of the family will be around this afternoon later. Why don't you tell them? It'd be a swell time for it. What are you talking about? Swell time for what? To tell them you're going to marry Chris. Oh. you got to tell them sometime, you know. Oh, sure. It isn't that I'm trying to be coy about it. Well, why not do it? No, uh, I'm afraid not today, Cliff. Well, it's none of my business, of course. I don't want to rush you. Hey, look, um, would you rather I just shut up about it? Well, certainly not. It's just that I... Well, um... I want to talk it over with Chris first. Besides, I hadn't planned to tell him until after the holidays anyway. Yeah. Paul. Yeah? Are you putting off telling the family because you hope Dad will come around? I mean... I know exactly what you mean, Cliff. It sure would be great if you'd only meet Chris and see what a wonderful person she is. If you'd only do that, I think you'd be all for the marriage. Yeah. Seems highly unlikely, though, I'm afraid. Certainly would solve everything if he would. Hey, uh, maybe if we could get Mom to meet her, she No, could... no, Cliff, I don't want any kind of pressure put on anybody regarding Chris. Either they're going to accept her or they're not. And that's something they've got to make up their own minds about. Yeah, but you are clinging to a kind of a hope that it'll work out some way before you announce that you're going to marry her, aren't you? Well, maybe. I really hadn't faced it squarely, but 
Unconsciously. Mm -hmm. Maybe quite right. Mm -hmm. Oh, gone it. It seems so ridiculous. I get so darn sore, Dad, but it's just like beating your head up against a stone wall to try to get anywhere with him when he makes up his mind about something. Hey, easy, old boy. I know, but what's going to happen after you get married? Is it going to cause some kind of an awful rift in the family? Hey, let's talk about last night. It was fun, wasn't it? No, but don't you see what I mean, Paul? (laughs) So you won't talk about last night. Oh, look, you're not kidding me, fella. I know you're worried about this one you're letting on. Come on now, admit it. Well, I am worried, of course, but we're not going to accomplish anything by laboring the subject. Oh, yeah, sure. But I do want you to know, Cliff, that I'll never cease to be grateful to you for your attitude. And I hope I can do something someday to show you how much I appreciate it. Oh, listen, you've done plenty all your life. Don't worry about that. (laughs) But thanks, anyway. (laughs) We'll be crying on each other's shoulder here in a minute. Yeah, I wonder if we should be going downstairs. What time is it getting to be? Mm, it's about five. Who's there? Come on in. Happy New Year, fellas. Uh, well, happy, happy New, New Year. Happy New Year. I appointed myself a special emissary to come up here and root you out. Well, now, you can believe it or not, but we were just saying we ought to be getting downstairs. I don't believe it. You both look too comfortable. Listen, baby, you question our veracity and your two big brothers will turn you up and stop. Thank you. <laughs> Hiya, Claude. Sit down. No, really. Mom wants you to come down. Is everybody here? No, but you know. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Hasn't anybody arrived but you? Well, Jack's here. How about Hazel? Well, she should be along any minute. She's bringing Hank and Margaret. You knew that Dan and Pinky had gone up to the tower. Hey! Margaret! Are you ready? Margaret, it's time to go to Grandfather's. I'll be right down, Mom! Margaret, is Hank up there? Oh, Hank! Hank! Mom, I'm in the living room. Well, Hank, are you ready? We're going over to... Why, Hank? Twelve. Thirteen. What in the world are you doing down there on the floor? I read an article in a magazine. I beg your pardon? It's an exercise. Watch. You lie flat on your back and arch your spine. You see? And you go up and down. Twenty times. Why? It releases tension and calms the nerves. It does, huh? Sixteen. Any time, any time you're worried or jittery, just try this, Mom. On the level, Mom, a little while ago, I was all tied up with nervous tension. And now I feel fine. Seventeen. Goodness, Hank, what have you got to be jittery about at your age? Eighteen. Mom, are these blue hair ribbons okay? Turn around. Well, you look very nice, Margaret. Nineteen. Would this dress do if I were a flower girl at a wedding? Well, that's an odd question. Why do you ask? Oh, I don't know. I've just been wondering about weddings. Twenty. <sighs> now, that may calm your nerves, Hank, but I don't think it's doing your best pants any good. <sighs> now, go comb your hair now and put your coat on, Hank. Hank, get up. Well, I just want to see if my nervous tension is going to come back. Hank, please. Your grandfather expected us at 3 o'clock. It's 3.02. Your sister's right, Hank. 3.02. Come on, get up. Here, give me your hand. On your feet, young man. <laughs> How's your tension? Well, I don't know. Well, go get ready. Gosh, stuff gets complicated sometimes. Look, Mom, isn't there a button in back that's kind of loose? Oh, dear. Well, here's a needle and thread. I brought them with me. Oh, good for you. Now, that was using your head. Here, let me sit here. I'll turn around. And remember, I can't sew a button on a wiggle worm. <laughs> oh, still. Yes, Mom. Mom. Hmm? You remember when the old Middleton place didn't have anybody living in it, and no paint on it, and old newspapers in the driveway and all that? Mm. Grandfather said it was a shameful disgrace to the neighborhood, didn't he? Mm-hmm. Well, now that Mr. Frome's bought it and fixed it up better than it ever was, well, Grandfather ought to be happy, but he isn't. He won't even walk past the Middleton place. He goes all the way around the block. If he even looks at it, he makes a noise like this. Uh, yes, yes. Mm-hmm, you're wiggling. I guess that's because Uncle Paul fell in love with Mr. Frome's sister. I don't want you discussing Uncle Paul. No, but I'll bet Grandfather wishes the Middleton house still had no paint on it and old newspapers in the driveway. What did I say about wiggling? Oh, excuse me. Mom. Well? Is Sharon Ann about the right size for a flower girl at a wedding? For instance, if Mrs. Abbott and Uncle Paul... Margaret, have you children been gossiping about Uncle Paul? No. It isn't a matter for you to discuss at all. I don't want to hear of you talking about it. Well, could I ask this question? Am I too tall for a flower girl? Margaret, turn around here. Sharon Ann can hardly wait to be a flower girl at some wedding. We can't have weddings just to accommodate Sharon Ann. Well, I know, but... Well, look, if Uncle Cliff married Roberta Evans, well, that would be okay with Grandfather, wouldn't it? We could have a swell wedding because he likes Roberta. I told Sharon Ann there was much more chance of Uncle Cliff That will do. But... Margaret? Just one more question, Mom. Just one. What is it? They 
said I wouldn't fit in so well at a wedding. Why not? They said I was too tall for a flower girl and too young for a bridesmaid. Is that true? Yes, Margaret, it is. Oh, all right, then. I don't care what happened. Oh, I'm, I'm ready, Mom. Well, now, Hank, that looks better. Well, he's got one hair standing up in back. Oh, don't be a perfectionist, Margaret. He looks just fine. Mom, what happens when you tear up a letter with a government stamp on it? Now, let's get... What did you say, Hank? Listen, it hasn't been through the mail, see? But what would happen to you if you just tore up a letter with a government stamp on it? Why, nothing. Really? Well, if you buy the stamp and don't happen to use it, it doesn't matter. Oh. Well, but, but what if it's somebody else's stamp? Look, let's take a, hy- a hypothetical case, Mom. Yes, let's do. All right. Take this hy- hypothetical case. Suppose somebody gave you a letter to mail. All right, you meant to mail it. And they said, now just suppose. Yeah. Suppose they said, rush down to the post office and mail this quick because I want it to go in a hurry. And you forgot it. In this hypothetical case, uh, when shall we have this happen? Last July or June. Seven or eight months ago? Yeah. Well, well, what would happen to you if you just tore up the letter and forgot all about it? I don't think it would be possible to forget all about it. Oh, golly, this is interesting. Keep quiet, Margaret. Why couldn't you forget it? Huh, Ma? Because you'd fail to trust. And the letter didn't belong to you and your conscience would bother you. And besides that, it's probably illegal. I see. Okay, let's go. Just a moment. Are you feeling a little tense, Hank? Yeah, but there's no point doing any more exercise, and all it does is just take your mind off your troubles for a few minutes. Hank? Hmm? Who? Margaret, you go and wait outside. Oh, Mom, this is the most interesting conversation I've heard all week. You heard what I said. Oh, golly, most of the time I listen to a lot of boring old stuff, and as soon as it gets interesting, I have to leave the room. Hank? Yes, ma'am. Close the door, Margaret. <laughs> Whose letter did you forget to mail, Hank? Grandfather's. Oh, dear, last July? Or June. It was at the Sky Ranch. I see. Well, when did you finally remember it? You know when you said to collect my old clothes to give to the Society of Friends to send to Europe? But that was ten days ago. Yeah, well, I remembered it ten days ago. It was in my old blue jeans. And you've torn up the letter? Oh, no. No. No, I I just considered it. I haven't torn it up yet. It's kind of crumpled and it's got some plum juice on it. Let me see it. And I guess orange juice on it, too. I was carrying fruit around in my pocket. Here. Goodness, you can't even read the address. You can read Grandfather's name on the back of it, all right. Well, why didn't you take this to your grandfather ten days ago and make a clean breast of it? Why didn't I? Yes, why didn't you? You mean, just give it to him? Certainly. When I've had it since July or June? Hank, things like this have to be faced sometime. You can't let a worry like this go on and on. Well, I was thinking of dropping it in a mailbox, but with a banana all over the address, I knew it would just come back from the dead letter office. That isn't the point, Hank. You have to admit your mistake, don't you see? You're dodging around. You have to be honest about it. But Grandfather's liable to just blow his cork. What's that phrase? Huh? Oh, never mind. Whether Grandfather's angry or not has nothing to do with this. You have to face the issue. Goodness knows how important this letter may be. Why, it might be to the Internal Revenue Department. It might be his income tax. No. Maybe it's a letter to an old friend. Perhaps it's a check somebody desperately needs. No. Maybe it's a doctor's prescription he got for somebody to save a life. Oh, no, Mom, don't say any more. No amount of exercising on the floor will dispel a guilty feeling, Hank. The only thing you can do about a guilty feeling is to to try to undo whatever harm you've done. Mm. Now, there's only one possible course now, Hank. You know that. You take this letter with you now, and when we get to your grandfather's house, you march right in like a man and tell him what you've done. Mom, I don't think I feel well. What? Maybe you'd better get the thermometer. I think I'm running a pretty high fever. Well, you'll have to take your fever right over to your grandfather's. It's getting late, and he's always impatient when people are on the uh, Fanny, ha- have you heard from Hazel? Uh, why can't people be on time? Don't fuss, Henry. They'll be along. Yeah, well, when? That's the question. Have you heard about your father's New Year's resolution? He isn't going to fuss about anything all during 1950. Oh, poor Dad. Why, you won't even be able to express an opinion. <laughs> On the contrary, Claudia, I reserve the right to express an opinion. Well, that takes care of that. <laughs> <laughs> I simply asked where everybody was. Dad also reserved the right to ask questions. <laughs> no, I'm not fussing, Clifford. I merely want to know something. Oh, well, Paul, what are you doing over there at the window? Uh, come here, come here. Join the party. Yes, Paul. We haven't heard about your New Year's Eve. Well, we did the town. Paul and I had a double date last night. <laughs> double date? 
Paul and Mrs. Abbott, Roberta, and me, and we had quite a time. Oh, how very gay. Confetti and toy balloons and paper hats, the whole thing? Yeah, not the paper hats. We were onlookers. The last time that Fanny and I went out for New Year's Eve, we felt as though we were sightseers at the fall of Rubin. <laughs> <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, Dad, I know how you felt. I think that's why we four decided to go to church together this morning. So that's where you went. Now, for some reason, Sharon Ann is always at the window watching the Middleton house. And whether we want it or not, we get all sorts of reports about your activities. We're kept informed of all your movements. Now, we knew you went somewhere this morning at 10.45. We were told so by our agent, Sharon Ann. <laughs> you better watch your step, Paul. You're being watched. Well, thanks for the warning. <laughs> <laughs> New Year's Eve. I've never been able to understand what motivates people on New Year's Eve. With one year dying and another beginning, it should be a time of solemn meditation. And what happens, huh? Paper hats and silly little horns and riotous behavior and swarming into hotels and nightclubs, congesting the traffic on the street corners. <laughs> well, they start the new year in a state of collapse. Now, your mother and I last night at 10 o'clock had a cup of hot chocolate and went to bed. Oh, my dear. Happy New Year. Where are Hazel and Hank? Oh, Hank kind of stopped outside. Mom's talking to him. Let me take your coat, young lady. Grandmother, I've got an idea. Yes, Margaret? You remember one New Year's you told fortunes with cards? Who's going to take a trip and who's going to get married and all that stuff? Oh, yeah. yeah. That was pretty good, Mom. Yeah, Mom, if you could tell me I'm going to pay all my Christmas bills, it would be quite a relief. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't mind if you all would like me to, if I haven't forgotten how to do it. Oh, sure, Mom. Run and get the cards, Margaret, will you? I want to know if I'm going to find a job and where and when and how much. Oh, okay, I'll get the cards. Uh, uh, here, Margaret, uh, right there on the desk. Oh, okay. Oh, somebody just came in. Who's there, Hazel? Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Year. Oh, Oh, Hazel, come in, come in. Oh, where have you been, Hank? Happy New Year, my boy. Happy New Year. Hank has something to tell his grandfather that he should have told him ten days ago. Oh, oh, sounds serious. We better clear up. Hmm? Golly, what's happened? All right, Hank. Well. All right, Hank. Grandfather. Yes, my boy. Last July, or June, at the Sky Ranch, one day, just after you'd been down here for a weekend... He gave me a letter to mail. Hey, speak up, speak up, son. Oh, he gave me a letter to mail. <laughs> he gave me a letter to mail because I was going into Woodside with Ben. And he wanted it to go in a hurry. Yes, yeah. yes, I did, Hank. Huh? Yes, sir. I just found it in some old pants. It's smudged in front so you can't see whose it's too, but here it is. Oh, poor oh, kid. Well, open it, Henry. Uh, uh, what's all this over the front of it? Fruit. <laughs> <laughs> open it, Henry. Maybe it wasn't important at all. Yeah. Well... Uh, oh, now, Hank, don't look so worried. Perhaps the damage can be repaired. Let's see. Oh, golly, isn't this interesting? Margaret, quiet. Is it an important letter, Father? Uh, uh, don't seem to remember. Uh, <coughs> Horace Egbert, President, Egbert Realty Company, Seacliff, San Francisco. Sir, I am summering at my daughter's ranch near Redwood City at the moment, but I was in Seacliff during the weekend, and once again I noticed the disreputable, run-down condition of the vacant Middleton place. Oh. <laughs> I have... <clears throat> yes, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, well, it's, it's all water under the bridge now. You have you're to think no more about it, Hank. I'm sure you didn't mislay it intentionally. Oh, golly, thanks, Grandfather. I think you owe Hank a vote of thanks. Well, I should think so. Complaining about the Middleton place, and now it's to show his house in the whole neighborhood. Yeah, my dear, when this letter was written, the place was a shambles and an eyesore. The fact that the place has now been fixed is not relevant. At the time the letter was written, that establishment was in an... Well, all right, Henry, all right. What difference does it make? It's a matter of principle. That's what difference it makes. Well, why not write him another letter and tell him you preferred the place the way it was? <laughs> but don't let Hank mail it. No. <laughs> Aren't you going to tell Fortune's grandmother I've got the cards here? Oh, I forgot all about it, Margaret. Come on, everybody gather around so you can see. Huh? Oh, sure. Sure. Yeah, I, I don't know room, if yeah. I can remember how to do it. Well, we'll all help you, Mother. I know what, what, what most of them mean. Here, Mom, let me shuffle the cards for you. Oh, thank you, Jack. Oh, this is fun. There you are, madam. Hmm. Oh, wait, don't you have to cross your palm with silver? Oh, be quiet, Margaret. You just be quiet yourself, Mr. Hayes. That's enough of that. Quiet, the great Madame Barbarossa is about to speak. <laughs> there I see a king. Well, this is the fortune of a married man. Good, this will be Dad's fortune. <laughs> certainly seems excited over it. <laughs> oh, you turned over the Ace of Diamonds. What does that mean? Why, Henry, see what the first card says about you. Hmm? That card means you're going to get a business letter. Yeah, from the Egbert Realty Company. <laughs> very funny. Very funny indeed. And look, this card means a dark, young, sinister man is going to cross your path. Hey, that's pretty exciting stuff, Grandfather. Maybe that's that guy from, huh? Hank, 
Oh, I'm sorry. Well, hey, let's try a woman's fortune. Why, why don't you do Claudia's, Mom? All right. Here. Mix them up. Yeah. Here you are. Now, Claudia, let's see what's in store for you. This better be good, Mom. Oh, it is. Look, the Ace of Hearts. What does that mean? Why, that means she's going to get a love letter. <laughs> Three guesses who that'll be from. <laughs> and the Eight of Diamonds. Why, Claudia, you have a wonderful fortune. That means you're going to have good news. Maybe Nikki's coming home. Oh, I hope so, my dear. We all hope so. Well, I think that's about all the fortune telling for this year. Maybe we'll do some more after supper if it isn't too late. Oh, just one more, Grandmother, please. This is lots of fun. Hey, how about Uncle Paul? Where is Paul? I'm right here behind you, Mom. Oh, you've hardly said a word. Well, I've been speechless watching the great Madame Barbara... What was that name you gave her, Jank? Oh, yeah, Barbarossa. Yes, you've had me under your spell, Madame Barbarossa. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that none. Oh, here are the cards already for you, Grandmother. All right. Now, whose fortune is this? This is Paul's, Mom. Very well. Now, let's see. The Ten of Spades. What does that mean? I've forgotten. Oh, I think it means disappointment, doesn't it? Oh, really? But that's an awful start, Paul. Well, maybe you'll end up better. Uh, a lot of foolishness, anyway. Of course, Henry. This is just for amusement. We're not taking it seriously. Oh, I am. I think it's exciting. <laughs> well, I'll tell you children's fortunes after supper. Dad, the three of clubs, what does that mean? Well, oh, the three of clubs means tears. I know that much. Are you sure, Hank? Sure. A guy was doing it at school the other day. And he said the three of clubs means tears. Well, you're just doing great so far, old boy. <laughs> I think the madam is in a rut. Well, let's see if we can't find something better here. Mm-hmm. Four of spades and six of spades and the ten of hearts. Uh... Hey, the ten of hearts! Hey, not so loud. But she turned the ten of hearts. That means a wedding. Hey, you're going to get married, Uncle Paul. What do you think of that? Can I be a flower girl, Uncle Paul? Hank, Margaret, not so much noise. Now, please, settle down. Yes, yes. Put up those cards, Fanny. I think we've had about enough of this nonsense. You've just heard Chapter 1, Book 73 of One Man's Family. Written, produced, and transcribed under the direction of Carlton E. Morse. Chapter 2, entitled Paul Makes a Decision, will come to you next week at this same time. What's on NBC today? Well, there's entertainment you can really enjoy when NBC brings you the adventures of Sam Spade and Peter Lawford, starring on Theater Guild on the air. For better listening, be sure to hear Sam Spade and Theater Guild later today on NBC. One Man's Family came to you from California. Coming up, it's the Quiz Kids. Stay tuned to NBC. NBC.